Perfect. Again, I'm just going to make sure I have my timer going over here so I don't drone on too much. Um, okay, well, thank you all for sort of being here and uh, spending time out of your sort of already busy sort of weekends to come sort of listen to what I have to say. Um, with, as I sort of uh, indicated, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes and then we'll move to sort of a general sort of Q&A thereafter. And so, you know, hold your questions if you do have them. Um, but given the sort of the parameters of time, there's some things sort of I just won't sort of be able to sort of do sort of in this sort of discussion. So more what I'm aiming to do is sort of plant some seeds to get people to sort of generally start thinking about how they can work with their messaging in whatever circumstances they happen to find themselves, whether it be sort of in their own research and scholarship, whether it happens to be in you know their own organizations that they're working with. Uh, or whether they happen to be sort of in government or non-government settings. Um, if you want to reach out to me afterwards, I have some contact details on the side. We're always sort of happy to to talk privately or one-on-one -on -one or even sort of, you know, in a group setting, uh, bounce ideas off and, and the like. So please feel free to reach out, you know, if there's anything you want to follow up on later. To sort of think, uh, to sort of prepare this conversation, I want to tell a story from about 10 years ago uh, from sort of the South African academic scene. So the South African academia has, for those who might have been follow, following in the last couple of years, has been sort of very going through a tumultuous phase. Sort of the movement like Roads Must Fall and other sort of student groups that are very much interested in decolonization have sort of brought sort of the nature of campuses to the fore and sort of it and sometimes managed to get global attention. At the same time though, it's, campuses have been very, um, have been touch points for labor activism too, precisely because sort of universities have these public missions, but at the same time, frequently have a good portion of their labor outsourced. For example, the custodial staff, the cleaning staff, or janitorial staff, often sort of subcontracted out. And so there are a lot of labor organizers, are, particularly on a university campus themselves, it's either students or professors, sort of point to the contradictions of these kinds of relations. So universities have often been sites of labor organizing, labor action, and the like. Now, one of the things about sort of, you know, if you know a little bit about South Africa, you know that the society is cross-cut cross by an extremely uh, large array of inequalities, social positions, and inequalities. So often sort of the custodial staff tend to be sort of older, tend to be black, uh, tend to be women, where the student body tends to sort of be the opposite. Not always, South Africa's changed quite a, quite a lot, but you know, the, the short version is that racial, class, or class, and gender divisions are quite apparent when you look at the student body versus the people who do the social reproduction of their student body. Now, given that sort of custodial staff have sort of very little power, you know, uh, they have to leverage whatever they do have in order to try to ensure that people recognize their worth. And so when uh, uh, custodial staff go on strike, one of the things that they do is they tip over all the, all the waste bins. The point being is that they want to demonstrate and show that without their presence, Campus, would, the campuses would be littered, right? That they do the work of making things clean, of looking nice, look, looking orderly, you know, the basic duties of custodial uh, care workers. However, in Bloemfontein at the University of the Free State, where this image I have on screen comes from, there's sort of a moment that sort of captured me or sort of caught my, caught my eye. On the right over here, we have um, custodial staff in red, in red uh, jerseys or, uh, from their union uh, who are pushing, pulling trash out of the bin. On left hand side, we have a young student who is, as much as they're pulling the uh, trash out, is picking up and putting it back in. And so there was a video of this event and it went viral in South Africa because these two groups, to these, two, these two people, spent you know, nearly two full minutes, you know, taking trash out and putting it in. And it sort of became sort of uh, an act of confrontation, frustration, and 
you know, to see who sort of has a degree of dominance. Now, you know, this over here, I think, is emblematic of, you know, how we need to think a little bit more clearly about our communications and what we're trying to do. Sort of as I see it, and again, like, welcome to have disagreements over here. Your main task is to find ways to bridge these racial, gender, gener generational, and even, yes, socioeconomic divides. Your job, you know, man, sort of communications, I think, can help over here. But there are limits, we'll come to that in a moment. But your job is to find a way to put these two on the same team, regardless of their positions, regardless of how they've come into the world, regardless of the trajectories in the world to date. Your way, you have to find a way to put this man's concern for environmental justice and these workers' concerns for you know, uh, labor rights on the same page. Sort of, in short, how do we get these two to both build the world in which we exist? How do we build solidarity between these two groups of people or sort of any other for that matter? So for me, I think the main uh, sort of precepts over here is that your messaging is, is always, uh, your political messaging is to try build broad-based democratic coalitions. These types of uh, um, projects can build vast mandates for social change. The part of that is really persuasion. You can't really command people to change, you have to persuade them to change. They have to make up their own mind that this is something that they want to do. Now, there's sort of a bit of a caveat over here, and that the forces that you're opposing uh, is are only as vulnerable as the people who are opposing or the political forces that are challenging it. If those uh, political forces are fairly brittle, well, then it's very, very hard to modify, appeal, change, force, compel those regimes that you're facing. So when it comes to sort of a couple of precepts about your communication, all of it is the attempt to sort of make sure that your coalition, your broad-based coalition is as robust as it can be. Sort of my background, uh, I am a you know, comparative historical sociologist who looks at questions of uh, militarism, war, conflict, uh, capitalism, and the types of inequalities that come around through them. I have sort of a few books that I've put out over the years. Uh, if you want to go read them, uh, you know, here's the titles, you can go check, go check them out. Despite sort of being interested in questions of imperialism, I still think that there's considerable value in thinking about you know, communication in the sense of like, what can communication do? What kinds of solidarities can it create? So my, myself, I work with an historical material paradigm I work with, with Marxist categories. But what I've done over here in this talk is try to sort of make the points that I'm making not sort of tied to any one political uh, uh, agenda or one political philosophy or one set of political vocabularies. Uh, so, you know, despite sort of my own background, I've tried to sort of make sure that all of these sort of points can are sort of wedded to one sort of perspective or one sort of uh, political set of goals. Um, still, I think it's very important that to, to be very upfront that if you don't have a plausible idea about how power works, regardless of any tips or tricks, they're going to sort of fail. So you can have that you can go read as many sale books about sales, you can go read as many books about marketing, you can go read as many books as you want about uh, project management or sort of even sort of strategic communication. If you go, you can go read all those things, but if you don't have an idea of how power works, your political communications are going to be flat to begin with. So I'm going to encourage you that uh, messaging comes after the development of a good social grammar. If you can't speak or at least think well about how power works, if you don't have a good comprehension of that, whatever type of intervention you're going to make is going to be a bit mismatched. That's not to say that you use a social grammar in all of your talking, in all of your messaging. I'll come to that in a moment. That's certainly not the case, but you do need to have a good theory of politics. If you don't understand how politics works or have a framework for understanding how politics works, again, the general tips and tricks approach fails. 
Um, talking a little bit about our agenda today, we're going to be speaking about the role of social movements, how to begin conversations, and then we're going to be moving down through you know, the practices of messaging. If we sort of have time, we'll get to how to structure interpersonal messaging, which I think is sort of one of the more neglected areas of political communication uh, rhetoric. Um, but it all depends sort of on time. Let's sort of turn quickly to the role of social movements. So the main goal of social movements, as I have here on the screen, is to deliver the votes to allies and to provide, give them a degree of re resolve. So whatever contest they happen to be in, if they're wavering, if they are a little bit, uh, if they are wanting to concede, your goal is to, you know, you know, give them courage and you give your representatives or the people that you're trying to uh, that you're trying to leverage as your representatives as your voices in rooms you're trying to give them a degree of resolve conversely the counterpart to that is that the whole purpose of, of social movements is to bring to drag to force political arguments outside of boardrooms outside of parliaments and into sort of private space of power. What I mean by that is we bring them into the house, we bring them into the workplace, you know, we bring them into places that typically aren't uh, spoken of. The whole, the whole purpose of it, and I want to be very intentional about this, is that the, the social movements through the activism, through the activity, through their presence, is to suspend the peace, is to pause the social pact, because it's the current social pact, it's the current social peace, it's the current treaties between the factions within, within society, within the polit political uh, arena, that has caused the grievances that you're trying to get resolved at the moment. So if you aren't prepared to disrupt peace, if you aren't prepared to disrupt the pact, well, then your social movement is gonna be stalled from the very beginning. The whole pur purpose is to create turbulence in hierarchical institutions. Um, if you're not prepared to create that turbulence, well, then you're a moralist. And moralism has never really convinced anyone. Um, part of this is you know, leveraging what power you have, which is the ability to withhold cooperation. Okay? This doesn't mean that you're not very savvy about how you use that power. Okay? For example, occupying uh, squares is an incredible drain upon your own resources and also starts to chip away at whatever um, uh, whatever um, credibility and whatever uh, cachet people have sort of given you because you're starting to disrupt patterns of everyday life. So they can start to be very, very taxing, which is why sort of, and we'll come to this in, a, in maybe in our question and answer session, is you only occupy streets, you only block, you, you only do that when you're about to win as a show of force. You don't do that at the very beginning because that, because you won't be able to get concessions and then you look weak. But that's sort of maybe jumping sort of ahead of myself at the moment. When it comes to social movements, the goal is not to govern. The goal is not to become a political party. The goal is to get the political parties to govern in the way that you want them to govern. Make them do the hard work of passing legislation, policies, regulations that you want, or if it happens to be bureaucracies, have them do the policy changes that you want. So this is ultimately about being oppositional. Don't fear being oppositional, especially on easy things. If you aren't prepared to be oppositional, if you aren't prepared to confront, if you aren't, if you aren't prepared to do those things, particularly on easy things, it's gonna be much harder to do things that are to do be confrontational on the things that do matter. Now, certainly people are going to disagree with you. That's fine. Some disapproval is going to be inevitable and isn't fun, particularly when you're being dragged on Twitter, for example. But that's also not really a big deal. Why are we thinking about social movements? Well, the first part is that, you know, we always hear this idea of, oh, we can change things from the inside. Well, that's a lie. The short version, the, the reason why that's a lie is institutional thickening makes it hard to reform bureaucracies or governments from the inside. There's a whole sort of inertia to institutions that you yourself as one person are not gained to change. 
sometimes we have these messiahistic ideas that I myself, by myself, with my own good moral judgment, at the right time, in the right boardroom, will make the key decision that will change things. And that's a lot of self-flattery. That's egotism at play. That's not really sociology. Institutional thickening makes it very hard to reform bureaucracies. The reason for that is that typically the problems are foundational in they're very foundational in how these institutions are designed, what components they have, and how those components come together uh, and then move forward. There's a degree of institutional drift from uh, these de from these designs, but they still nevertheless ex exist. Your purpose over here is to try and get the institutions to shift. Okay, we want to overhaul and remandate them, not uh, do incremental reform. The reason we want to overhaul and remand re and, and remandate is because if if you've picked the right grievance, it's too important to leave it to incremental reform. So, for example, if you are being if you're involved in anti-privatization of water campaign, and people are currently paying you know, a third of the income to get water, and you say, well, water is a human right, and you know you start to enter negotiations, you, you start a social movement, you get some power, you enter negotiations with the the local government, and the local government says, okay, fine, we'll do it in three years. We, we'll put a strategy together that in three years' time we will move away from privatized water meters. And you go, oh, yes, done, excellent, going home now. Well, that's, they've just stalled you so that they're waiting for your power to dissipate and then they won't do it. You can't, it's very, very hard. It's impossible to really, I would say, to reform bureaucracies from the inside. You have to overhaul them and remandate them. Sometimes this requires using the past to break the past. What do I mean by that is that often institutions have mission statements, aspirations, goals they wish to achieve. And you say, well, you were set up to do this, but you have not accomplished this. You can't do this. This is your track record. And so we can't, and with your track record, you have not been able to fulfill your mandate. So point to the contradictions between the mandates and their track records and use it as leverage to, over, to break and reestablish those institutions from the ground up. In other words, find the gaps between the unrealized stipulated aspirations and what's actually taken place. And that will provide ways to remandate. And hopefully between how the institutions were designed initially and what we subsequently learned about those institutions or institutions in general or that particular area, you can then update those designs uh, to sort of meet the moment. When it comes to messaging, the, the whole sort of purpose in a social movement is to move them one step to the left or one step to the closer to your goal here. In my case, it's, it's the left, but you can substitute left with anything else. Uh, you want to find the right messaging for whatever group they happen to be, whether it be, you know, in this case, opposed but not active, undecided and not active, sympathetic but not active. Whatever it happens to be, your goal is to find a, a, a person or set of people where they happen to be and move them one step left. So this requires uh, sort of you being very flexible uh, about your types of messaging, but also having a number of types of actors within your organization or with inside your network or with inside your movement that can speak well to each one of these groups so that you can move them one step to the left so that they can get closer to being, you know, to building a broad-based coalition. Remember, the whole point is to say that we are the many and you are the few, that, you know, you have the popular cause, the other person does not have the popular cause, and you can't get that if you start taking very dogmatic positions to begin with. There may be good philosophy and good thought about where you want to get, but if you if you start with that messaging and that messaging alone, you're not going to be able to try find people who are undecided but not actively supporting your cause. So if you have to find these groups and bring them one step to the left. So let's start with how do we begin conversations? Um, first impressions matter quite a lot. Uh, I would say that one of the most important elements is respect. Uh, 
you have to respect people who have views that may be even very offensive to you uh, and it's a game of reciprocity and it's in it's in your move first now if you say oh well i don't want to work with people <clears throat> who i find offensive well i want you to remember that mandela worked with the clack what i'm saying over here is that the anc worked with their, oh, with their political opponents to ensure that they wonder why i wouldn't die here they worked with their political opponents to ensure that they could bring democratization to South Africa. You, the people that you're trying, who, who you want to be on your side right now, don't have the same views as you. If they did, they would be on your side. So you have to reach out to other people who aren't already in your camp and try to persuade them that your cause is just. So that means talking to people whose politics and viewpoints, worldviews are maybe infeminate to you. Now, Grant, there, there are people who are too far gone and you want to isolate them. But for the most for the most part, people have different takes on things. And your job, goal is to take is to find them where they are and move them one step to left. So you have to find out what they're saying and you have to find out why they're saying that. In all cases, be generous and charitable, because often the types of grievances that they're uh, using uh, and sometimes they expressed in racial, gendered, uh, sexual uh, prejudices are sometimes more fundamental than those expressions. So that's not to say that there's no such thing as, as people who have intense pre prejudices. There are. Sometimes that those prejudices are just poor explanations for other, for other deeper grievances that they may have. So try to find out what people are saying, why they come to believe what they do, and so on and so forth. When it comes to messaging, uh, the first first precept, and this is the most important, is something you don't take. That, that there's only one thing you take out from this today, it's the, is that you first do no harm. It's sort of, it's the Hippocratic oath for communicators. Whatever you do, the main thing is to make sure that you don't hurt your own movement, your own messaging campaign, your own uh, uh, representative. If you're working on someone else's campaign, yeah. Uh, requires, I think, you know, some things that we're sort of well aware of, you have to plan your messaging, uh, you know, your messaging should always be contemplative and active, rather than responsive and in a moment. So what if the type of scenario occurs, what type of messaging will we use? So use scenario planning to pre prepare messaging that that will occur. Um, at minimum, and again, this is at the, the a mandatory minimum over here, you have to do a b testing you have to do internal a b testing so <clears throat> whether it comes to graphics or messaging or even things like tweets you have two separate teams create two different uh mock-ups and then decide which one is better and why and then maybe you can combine elements of the, of the both but you have to do a b testing even as things that are simple as slideshows for me i always should make sure to do at least two or three other tests for individual slides to see which one is better. Now that sort of slideshows aren't going to change the world, PowerPoints are not going to change the world, but the point is that you have to start making sure that you're practicing good habits then. So when it comes to press releases, uh, campaigns, photographs, other types of uh, other types of messaging that you are intentional about what you're trying to put out. Um, another basic, all statements need to have objectives. What are you trying to accomplish with, with this? The first question that you always need to ask is, what are you trying to accomplish with this? And everyone in your messaging team and the people who are going to be disseminating your messages need to be able to give you clear, crisp, and concise answers to that question. Another way to think about your messaging is that they become decision catalysts. You take someone where they, where they are you know, where you ask them a question, and we'll come to that in a moment, and their intuitive response is, is no, you want to get them to go from no to maybe. So we'll go back to the, the idea of water privatization. So if someone says, ah, we want to, you know, uh, decommodify water because water is a human right, and your municipal manager is like, no. How do you get him to go from no to maybe to yes? How do we move that particular person and, and persuade them to join your cause to decommodify water, to you know, actually materially insist 
that water is a human right. Um, other elements, your whole purpose is to try locate and dislocate. What do I mean by that is find where people are and dislocate them uh, so that they can move one step to the left. Give people uh, maps, touch points. What do I mean by, I'm not saying actually like physical maps, I'm saying use your words as maps for people to find where people are. Give them ideas so that they can take their base of knowledge and connect it with your base of knowledge or your uh, messaging project. This has sort of four basic components over here. And we're going to go through an example that has that speaks to each one of these things. So when you are doing your messaging, you want to situate the problem or you want to situate the issue. You need to identify why it's important. You need to identify the intervention you're going to make. And then you're going to identify what comes next. Those are the basic four components that every good messaging campaign uh, tends to have. Okay, I'm going to give you an example in a moment. And when you when we look at this example, I want you to you know focus on the use of simple words. I want you to focus on anchors and bridges. So how do we find an anchor and how do we build bridges to people? How do we reframe core issues and how do we open up space for discussion? And how do we create answers or propose options that were previously unconsidered? How do we bring things into the conversation that were previously left out of the conversation? And again, what are the stakes and statuses? And then finally, questions of the past, present and future. Okay. Direction and trajectory. Where are we going with these things? So I want you to focus on those six elements in sort of the next uh, sort of example. So I, I'll read it sort of for you. Uh, this is just a, a state, uh, this is just a, a statement and it's sort of for academic work, but you can modify it for your own purpose. Many economists now understand the law and institution that the law and institutions are crucial for economic development. Unfortunately, too often their conception of law is unduly narrow and formal. They imagine, for example, that the rule of law means strong and clear property rights. Societies who arrange property, <laughs> societies who arrange property differently will also develop differently, with more or less inequality, more or less environmental damage, more or less technological innovation, more or less social exclusion. Although property is crucial for development, this one-size-fits-all slogan tells us very little. Property law can be arranged in lots of ways. Our project aims to show the social and political choices embedded in different property regimes, whether formal or informal, and their significance for development. Sadly, we know too little about the range of possibilities. I hope that by setting a slogan, strong and clear property rights aside, we can sharpen the political choices uh, the political choice makers face in creating property regimes conducive to their society's goals. We go back to this idea over here of trying to uh, locate and dislocate. What is the current problem and how do we try to shift it? The problem at the moment is that property rights are only, property regimes are only understood as private property regimes that uh, allow for uh, capitalist free trade. Uh, but the other types of property regimes. So if we simply uh, believe that law's sole purpose is to maintain and preserve you know, private property regimes for free trade, well then we are now, the problem over here is to try expand our idea of what property is and how it can best better serve society with other types of configurations. So if we try to do that, we have to lead people, we have to hold their hands, we have to, in some ways, create the syllogisms for them to contemplate that things could be different. So that's what this sort of example is sort of trying to do, sort of in a very, you know, apparently apolitical way, or apparently de-radicalized way, is trying to create ideas that things could be different in a person's mind. And so you then use that as an opportunity for further intervention. This brings me to uh, 
the component about organizing messages. Um, when we do messaging, always try to look for practical symbolism. Find tangible problems that encapsulate abstract ideas. We'll go to this example of water privatization. If you think that water is a human right and access to finance shouldn't be an impediment to getting water, and water is currently commodified in your society, well, then you need to decommodify it. And so if your problem is like with the commodification of basic resources uh, for humans to reproduce themselves, well, now we're starting to think about high level social philosophy. But at the same time, these things have practical concerns on the ground, whether people can get water or not. So anti-privatization anti campaigns around water are very uh, tangible, but they also encompass abstract ideals. But the thing is that they also uh, pro projects that may be possible to win. So as you sort of find these projects and you try and you make uh, progress on them, so you start demonstrating that you have a degree of capacity and capability and credibility. And so you give people confidence that you're able to actually champion their causes or advance their causes, or that maybe you have that you're worth listening to. So resolve tangible problems, then encapsulate abstract ideals. When it comes to this type of messaging, you know, crisp and concise, get to the point. And so this sort of the image over here as a good example of that. Um, we think of these things as small tactics. Okay. This anti-privatization campaign, we can imagine our minds over here, uh, an opportunity for you to grow your social movement, uh, to use your messaging, to find allies like-minded, bring them to your side. When it comes to these small tactics, lower the barrier for entry. So you know, don't go out and say you can only be part of the social movement if you come down to the mass protest and you want to crack in the skulls of the police. That's not many people are going to come and do that up front, right? So lower the barrier for entry. Hey, you know, forward this thing, post this thing on social media, forward it to your friends, uh, lower the threshold for entry. Uh, come hand out some flyers. Uh, you know, would you be able to, you know, uh, do some water distribution for us? Would you be able to come do a site visit and take some photographs for us? And these things ultimately you know small tactics that can help grow your movement ultimately though it's about what types of feelings do you cultivate and do you leave the public with is your organization the type of people that people go oh i'm glad to see these people here or do they or do they or their initial impression like oh god they're here again you know now we're gonna now problems are gonna come so these aren't questions of compromise these are questions of effect you know you want to have good associations good feelings when you arrive in the public. When it comes to growing new members, uh, particularly if your organization has been around for two or three years, you can't expect people to have to have been part of the same types of conversations that you have had with your uh, uh, the people who sort of founded the group. Um, so, you know, it's people are going to take time to learn. So they might not have the right perspectives or the, the most studied perspectives or be using the right words. You have to so don't begrudge them for that you know you were once in that spot too rather find ways for new members to slowly and comfortably learn your tactics and strategy so find ways that they can build confidence that they themselves are in the right uh, organization too people want to be on a winning side show that you have a plan to win how do you ensure that you get to the we are the many and they are the few how do, we get, how do we get there? So narratives are very helpful, drama is very helpful, but only if these things serve the higher goal. You have to have good pathways. You have to create the belief that people will be on the right team when everything, when the dust settles. Uh, when it comes to uh, your messaging, start with something manageable. Pick battles big enough to matter, but small enough to win. For example, the anti-privatization water campaign that I keep on sort of referring to over here. This builds credibility and trust to implement other, other change. If you win here, 
people think, oh, you know, they have a better chance of winning there. Okay. Always try to find uh, things that are simple and uncontroversial to frame your message and group uh, as just and right. Water is a human right. There are very, very few people who are going to disagree with that. So simple, easy, encapsulated, and so that show that you that your things are just and right. Ultimately, your messaging, your framework over here has to offer a more attractive vision than a status quo. You know, you want to win, and you and you want people to know that once you've won, or when your group wins, things will be better. So it will be better when, and in order to in order for people to believe that, you need to have a good track record. Um, going back to questions of participation, uh, there's very little utility in playing language games. We see this sort of in the American left quite a lot, uh, particularly in the center left. Uh, so people are so enamored with proving that they've gone to good graduate programs and that they're not, not that they aren't interested in using the words that most people use. Your job is not to show how well educated you are. Your job is to use your education to win. So an advanced conceptual vocabulary typically alienates people, the supporters you need to win. If we want to build broad-based democratic coalitions, you're going to need to work with people who aren't, that don't have a high degree, a high political literacy rate. Most people don't have a high political literacy rate. You still have to work with them. You still have to bring them onto your team. You still have to make them find ways to support your goals. You have to make it understandable for them. Big words don't help. You know, I'm not saying that you don't use big words. Okay. It's very, very important to use the books you've read. And it's always important to continue to read books. But it's important to use the books you've read to help your clarity of thought. Okay. But there's a difference between a clarity of thought and a clarity of communications to people who haven't read those big books. Okay. We also have to understand that people aren't disinterested in, in activism because they are moral. Rather, they're just not well positioned to participate. We go back, and this again may maybe be, be a bit controversial over here, but during the apartheid, it's, so, uh, we, so let me put it this way, when people surveyed white people in apartheid, during apartheid to say, do you support apartheid or not? The vast majority of people said no, yet pers apartheid persisted. Now there's certainly the gains and windfalls to be had from projects of whiteness, white superiority, white supremacy, and so on and so forth. At the same time though, people are so wrapped up in their everyday lives, they've got other commitments, they have alien parents, they have bills to pay, that they're not well positioned to participate in your cause. Okay. The point over here, and we'll get to this in a moment, is you have to find ways that can better position them to participate. The whole point of your activism, not your, not your messaging, your activism is to, is to ensure that you're addressing the grievances that's, that are inhibiting people from participating in politics in the first place. So if they're not participating in politics at the moment, don't begrudge them. Your job is to solve it so that they can. Again, this comes back down to a theme that I'm trying to talk to, that you have to reach out to those who don't share your dispositions and demands and bring them onto your team. So test and assess the reception of ideas from a range of standpoints. Focus groups are incredibly important to do so, but you know, uh, there are other techniques too. Again, you want to be relatable to as many people as possible, again, so that you can say that we are the many and they are the few. So you need a, a variety of actors within your So you need a variety of actors within your organization that can speak to different types of communities and constituencies. So again, diversity of tactics and diversity of personnel. Um, going back to, to something I said earlier, people are busy with life or they suffer from the problems that you want to address. It's not that, that because people are marching in the streets that they aren't interested or keen, they're just not well positioned where they are at the moment, okay? So people's lives, particularly under intense neoliberalism, where all time is work time, 
where every element of our life is commodified, where many people have to hustle to do several jobs at the same time. Uh, you have to persuade people that there's merit in taking time out of their already too busy day to come listen to what you have to say, to entertain your propositions. The onus is on you to make the case that your goals are, are relevant and can speak to what people are looking for. If you can't accomplish that, that is not the public's fault. That is your fault. I want to be very, very clear about that. It's not that people are immoral. It's that you aren't good with your, you aren't a good organization. You aren't an effective organization. You may have laudable goals, but you are not effective. And those are two very, very different things. Many people have very, have very, very good goals. Not many people accomplish their goals. Explain and identify what are the stake, detail the implications, provide pathways to win, provide a track record that you can accomplish this, provide practical symbolism that encompasses why, what the stakes are, why these things matter. Let's turn to, to the toolkits that you may be able to use. Um, number of things that are sort of very useful, I'm sort of just gonna go through them very, very quickly. Inverse planning, in, inverse sequence planning, sort of maybe the, the, the tool that I find the most important. What is your goal? And you work back, backwards from that. If I want to, so for example, if I want to write a book in a year's time, and a book is say 80,000 words, uh, I need to write at least 300 words, at least 400 words, 500 words, whatever it happens to be a day in order to get there. I need to, okay, well, I'm gonna take time off for holidays and vacations, there's going to be time where I won't be able to do 500 words per day. Well, then I need, I need monthly targets. So you start breaking things down from your goal backwards. So what, what I want to accomplish and then what are the things that need to be done prior to getting there. And that can start to give you a sense of what you need to accomplish now in order to get to your final destination. Uh, cognitive mapping is very, very important. Semiotics are very, very important. Identify you know, the alliances, you can do a network analysis of the alliances, affiliations, and associations that people have. Sort of very, very useful. Uh, as with everything, identifying cause and effect. You know, moving away from the mythology of how things work or the mystified social relations of how things work, actually identifying what are the primary causal factors in your society. For example, what are the primary cause of privatization in, of water in your community? Yes, there's the climate of neoliberalism, but who made what decision when and where? Who influenced that? I understand those particular causes and effects can give you moments to understand where you need to intervene to ensure that your intervention will be successful. You know, to reiterate a point I said earlier, always use focus groups to uh, prototype your strategies and where possible use or commission research. Uh, I think commissioning research is very, very important because it shows that you are taking a studied view to the problem at hand. You yourself as an organization have gone out of your way to collect data, understand it, and then put it into, into the public. You're not just simply you know, saying here is an issue. You say, here, I studied this and I found out this is why it's an issue. Again, most people go, oh, they've actually done the work. You know, you're again, building credibility. So even though your answers may be expected, it still provides confidence to others that you are a credible actor. Um, always do what is best, not what is easy. Uh, so veterans always do the hard work first. Uh, rookies look to do the easy things. Now, the dividends that come from doing the hard work first, you may accomplish fewer things by doing the hard work first, but you'll be more effective in the long run. Remember, it's not how many things you do, it's the, the weight of the things that you do that matters. So don't contrive to justify taking the easy route. Okay, um, you know that that all is all depend upon your situation, your context, and so I'm not going to sort of belabor the point there. The other thing is that wasting time is inevitable. Don't dwell on it. What isn't guaranteed is actually getting real work done. So focus on getting real work done. And if you have a degree, a, a, a bit of waste, that's fine. That's okay. Don't begrudge it. Um, 
I was thinking to sort of end up end off with my my presentation with this sort of last section over here. We're going to talk about the utility of classic rhetoric. Okay, I would encourage all of you to go read uh, Aristotle's rhetoric, uh, or even sort of more contemporary rhetoric textbooks that sort of try to uh, you know bring Aristotle into the twenty first century. Or, you know, find pathways and bridges between his world and our world. One of the most important things about classical rhetoric is persuasion is about planting seeds. You're not trying to compel people to change, you're getting them to, you're trying to persuade them to change. You're trying to get them to do the work of changing their own minds. What's easier, you getting someone to change their mind or getting someone else to change their own mind? They know their own mind better than you do, much, much better than you do. So plant seeds. What? How would our society look if we didn't have, if water was a human right? It's a question. Leave it, leave it at that. Pose questions and get people to think about what the future may be under those conditions. And remember, it's a person who's asking the questions that always drives the agenda because they set the parameters under which answers can be given. Okay, always be asking the questions. One of the things that is very useful is enth enthymemes. Uh, enthymemes are uh, a feature of classic rhetoric, rhetoric where you, know, you use someone else's unstated assumptions and you get them to add it into the argument. Remember, argumentation and communications is both logical, but it's also sentimental. How do, we, how do people feel about the argument? Okay. Is it palatable? Is it interesting? Is it repulsive? Okay. What is the what is the initial orientation towards that? So again, audiences know their views and beliefs better than you do. So get them to do the hard work of changing their own minds. Um, particularly when you're speaking to mass audiences, you can't address all the sentiments in a room. So let the audiences uh, address the sentiments uh, themselves. And then sort of uh, as we sort of end, start to sort of transition towards the Q&A, contrasts are sort of very, very helpful. The bigger the contrast, the, the more potential there is for persuasion. We go from, you know, privatized water or you have to pay for water to water as a human right. It's a big contrast between those two things. Um, the other thing when it comes to contrast is you can use doubt to delay the decision until conditions are on your side. Yeah, you know, so you can say, have you considered what about, you know, have you ever doubted that? Okay, going back to the idea that you're trying to find decision catalysts, things I mentioned earlier, make decision paths sequential and incremental, make it easy for people to agree. Water is a human right. Okay, it's easy from it's easy for people to agree with that sentiment. Okay. Um, and again, you make sure that you, you create rejection-free approaches. There's no pressure. Okay, uh, I'm not. You know, so you know, this is sort of a bit of sales tactics. I'm not sure this is for you, but have you ever tried, or um, you know, have you ever thought about water being a human right? You know, so like, they don't, if you know, there's, there's nothing at stake if they reject if they reject it. It's very different from will you show up to your protest on Sunday? People are going to be like, yeah, maybe not. You go, have you? What if? If what about water being a human right? Oh, I like that. Well, we have this event on Sunday. You can come check out. Yeah, you know, if you're around. It's very, very different uh, types of messaging uh, projects. I'm going to sort of pause it over here on the interpersonal messaging, uh, simply because I'm sort of more interested in sort of having a discussion with you guys. I'm going to leave though with sort of two sort of caveats over here. Okay. Um, above all, we must always remember, though, that language does not actually structure politics. And messaging can help provide narratives to help persuasion or rationalization for people joining your side. Okay. It's often post hoc. It's how to get people to justify what they've been doing or what they would like to do. Okay. But often their efficacy or, ineff or, in or ineffectiveness is conditional and determines and is external to that moment. People may not be persuaded by your views that water is a human is a uh, human right because you know 
so few things are, because life is so commodified that the idea that there being things that people are due simply for the fact of being alive may be just so uh, discombobulating to them. So there are things that are outside of your control, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to persuade, that you shouldn't try to do the good rationalization. So the final difficulty that we have, and this again is a bit of a contrast to say the 1960s, for example, is that there is a high degree of uh, the erosion of common cultures or worldview. Again, this is, no one sort of belabor this point, it sounds sort of like a grumpy old man over here, but we've moved from having mass media, where there are two or three television stations, to things being much more personalized now. And so this means that there are very few starting points for conversations because the information that people are getting is so varied. Okay, so this comes back down to why you need to meet people where they happen to be, because you can't take for granted that they have the same set of information as you do. Okay, so this is why there's a degree that I think activism has become much more difficult now because you have to do it's it's become much more granular because you have to find out where each person is almost individually and sort of try to sort of move them to your to your goalposts. So as much, as much as we have very personalized media at the moment, we need to have very sort of tailored activism and messaging too. That's very sort of costly in sort of many, many senses, but this is why you need sort of social movements so you have lots of people who are able to do this kind of work. Sort of my final points over here is that movements need poets and philosophers. Very, very important. The poets speak it true, but you also need lawyers and accountants, particularly when it comes to your messaging too. How costly is your messaging? And is it, and what are the legal, or legal ramifications of doing this or that? So when it comes to putting your teams together, yes, poets and philosophers, yes, lawyers and accountants. There's a role for everyone to play, and you need to find ways to best build and draw upon everyone's skill set. I'm going to pause it over there and thank you for your time. And we, I understand we now move and transition to uh, the next portions of this uh, conversation. So I'm going to sort of hand it over and uh, let someone else sort of quarterback the Q&A component. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott. And a quick round of applause for reactions. Feel free to unmic yourselves for uh, Scott. This was a wonderful session. Um, <laughs> Eye-opening for me, messaging is always key, um, especially when we're uh, organizing on the ground. I remember uh, when we spent deliberate amounts of time uh, creating rhetoric back from back when I was younger, if I may. <laughs> um, so for this Q&A session, you can raise your hand um, through the reactions tab. Alternatively, you can drop a star on an, or an asterisk in the chat and we will go through those lists um, as, as they populate. Um, it's going to be pretty relaxed um, and laid back, so take your time. Um, and the first person to speak is Marvan. Uh, go on. Uh, 